If I ask you to uh, come up here and to pray for your church, I know a number of you would come and pray for your church, and I'm going to ask you to do that in just a little bit. But first of all, I want to talk about Grace Point, that we're a team. And if we're not, we will fail. We know that. And so Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5 says this. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. And I mean, we're all different, aren't we? The next verse says this here. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. As I think and I look back, that God saves and he even uses the common, the average, the ordinary person who struggles each and every day in their walk. Those who do that are constantly looking for Christ's strength and guidance in their life. Uh, there are individual people that the world never would have picked because the world, they would not have measured up to what the world expects from people. It states in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's us. Now, why did God do this, and why does God do this? Because I believe this, that when we're used by God, then we won't steal the glory from God. He uses the less likely people so that he receives all the glory. Is that not true? Now, many of us here, uh, we have past. We know our past. Uh, we have scars. We have memories. Uh, you know, we're not, a, we're not proud of those things that we did in the past, and we're ashamed of those things. Not only that, others know our past, and uh, they can't believe or understand how in the world we could try to serve God at all because of our past. The devil knows our past. And he's good at reminding us about our past, isn't he? And uh, he tells others about our past. And we constantly hear his little voice in our heads, you're no good, you're unworthy, you're nothing. You're nothing but a hypocrite. And uh, the devil's good at promoting that in our minds and our hearts, isn't he? But also, we know this, we know that we have believed. We know we have put our faith in the Son of God, the fact that he died for our sins and rose from the grave victoriously, and we put our faith in that gospel and we have been forgiven. And that forgiveness continues even today, even when we fail today. Uh, I remember the story of a pastor who uh, he was on a platform in a seat and somebody sent him up a note and was, some of his old friends were in the service. And uh, his old friend said this here, how can you be up there with your past? And uh, the pastor didn't say anything at that moment, but when he went up to the pulpit, he opened up that note, he read it publicly. And he said, it's all true, it's awful, but the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen? And uh, we should never forget that. And the question is, how then can God use us? ordinary common people to fulfill his purpose and his plan. I really believe the way God has done this, he's put together a team. He's put together one body, a church, with many members, yet they're one body. And now get this, God, rather than singling out individuals, he uses, now get this, he uses a team, one body, to carry out his church's mission. And in that way, individuals are not to receive the glory when the church will really accomplish something. But then the team, as one, they give all the glory to God alone. Amen? It's not about any individual. It's about us as a team, as one body, as one church. And all of that goes together to make us what we are today if we do anything. If ever anybody receives any praise, it has to be as a team. Amen? You didn't get there by yourself. I don't care who you are. Amen? From opening the door to cleaning the floors to whatever it might be, nobody got here by themselves. No individual. It's a team effort. 
And that is so important. Ephesians 4.12 says this here. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto edifying. It's all of us together being molded together that can be effectually used by God. Amen? He states then in verse 7 and 8, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Every one of us have multiple gifts. And God says we are to put our gifts together and be fitly framed together and become one. To become an army of one. That's what God wants from you and he wants from me. God has given individuals certain abilities within his church to help it. To help the church to be complete, whole, a team, one body. Today we're one body but each having different functioning parts. And by the way, that was determined by God in what gifts he gave us individually. God compares the one-body church with the human physical body. Though our human body is one, it has many parts so that it can function, work as one. And likewise, the church. So I'm going to make a comparison between the human body and the church today. Hope that we can get something from it. First of all, some parts of the body are for protection, the physical body, your little fingernails <laughs> for protection. You don't think you need those until they're gone. <laughs> they help keep from bruises, of, uh, you know, meat slicers, <laughs> uh, all kinds of cuts and abrasion. You need your fingernails. Uh, they protect you. And then, not only your fingernails, your eyelids. Now, ladies, you can paint them up and they look real pretty. But really, your eyelids, your eyelids are for protection from wind, dirt, objects, and they're even to help you sleep. Isn't that something? So, they are for protection. And then, likewise, the church, we need protectors. Uh, we need somebody to protect the church. First of all, from doctrinal error. Now, while it's the privilege of every believer to interpret the Scriptures, most do not interpret rightly dividing. And as a result of that, it's created lots of error and confusion. And I think that you and I, we need to be grateful for those of the past who were willing to stand up for the inerrancy of the Scriptures and also rightly dividing. People like Warren Wiersbe, Cornelius Stamm, Les Felick, Richard Jordan, Robert Anderson, Paul Sadler, Charles Baker, Keith Blades, Dawson Barlow, Joe Fink, Robert Wade, Donald Webb, J.C. O'Hare, Harry Boltema, Frederick Lewis, Vernon Schultz, Ernest Campbell, Craig McDonald, John Verdischen, Alex Kurtz, Rick, Ricky Kurth, Clarence Larkin, Arthur Sims, William Thurman, R. Shiflett, C.O. Griggs, Walter Patrick, uh, T. McLean, and Justin Johnson. You say, I don't know some of these. You need to get to know them because they are the ones who stood for the truth. And because they stood for the truth, they were willing, though, to pay the price it cost them within Christianity and within Christendom for standing for the truth of rightly dividing the word of Scripture. And not only all of them, what about our apostle, the apostle Paul? Paul, he defended us against doctrinal error, did he not? And then also to protect us from within divisions. These are people within the church that they're the peacemakers. When a problem comes up, they resolve the problem in a biblical way in order to restore that union, uh, that unity and that oneness. Within the church, they protect that unity, that one accord. Paul told us that there will become times wolves in sheep's clothing is going to come into the church. 
and they are self-centered, self-seeking individual people. And he says, listen, I want you to mark them that cause division. You know, even the Apostle Paul, he stood up face to face with Apostle Peter. Why did he stand up against Peter? Because Peter was wrong dispensationally. He was trying to bring law back into grace. Amen. We need protectors. And these protectors for Christ's honor and Christ's church are always alert. If anything or anyone could possibly hurt the church, they immediately spring into action in grace and they try to put out that fire. I personally believe that I'm one of those. <laughs> I look at, I, I know because from experience, when I see something happening, there's something that supersedes individuals and even me. And it's the cause of Christ within his church. And you leap into action to try to protect the church so that the church is not damaged. And by the way, it's been damaged enough in society, has it not? God help us to maintain that. And then also protect us from not only doctrinal error within divisions, but also any diversions. A lot of people, they come up with new ideas and new suggestions for programs and so on. But regardless of how good their intentions might be, if those programs would take us away from the main purpose God has called us to fulfill or to do, these individual people, they leap up, they encourage us to stay the task, the course that God has called us to do. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety, right? Example, politics. <laughs> I hate what my country's doing right now. No, I, I do. And, uh, you know, I believe what we can do locally is more important because that's our own legislation down here that's in a turmoil right now. And, uh, but, you know, God didn't call me to be a politician. God called me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Huh? And uh, I'm going to trust him with my country. I see it going down the tubes. It's going to be a new day for us as Christians. I understand that. But God didn't call me to try to get somebody elected who will go back on his word anyway. God called me to stick with absolute truth that never changes. And so we have to be careful about that. Now, as a church, our priorities are evangelism. We try to win people to Christ with the true gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And then also training. We try to teach them so that they can grow up and mature you know, to that maturity, to show them how to study the scriptures rightly divided so that they might apply what is for them even today. Worship is another thing. That's where we gather together and we together, we praise him because he is worthy. And then care, that means that as a church, we try to help watch care over the other members in the body so that when they're having difficulties, if we can come alongside and help them, that's what we want to do. And then lastly, serve. That means each individual member of Grace Point, we try to use whatever ability God's given us to make his church successful that will glorify him. Amen? Some parts of the body are for protection. Some parts of the body are for, or are for producing. Example, the physical body, tear ducts, uh, something that is so small, but tear ducts that produce lubrication for our eyes in order that we might properly see. A uh, preacher, uh, he was preaching a revival in a church. He went to some people's home, a family's, to have a meal, and uh, the lady there, he noticed, was blind. And he graciously asked, her, how did you become blind? And she said this, she said that her Tear, her tear ducts had dried up, that her eyes could not get a single drop of a tear. And with no tears, she said, I finally lost my eyes in the sense of vision. I became blind. And something so small, so insignificant, unseen, a little tear duct that produces tears for us to be able to see and have sight. Likewise, those within the church those who help produce things within the church's ministries. Usually they're behind the scenes. They're working, volunteering. They're helping ministries to be successful, to produce, from the lot attendants 
to the greeters, to the nursery, to the preparation of the Lord's Supper from the maintenance of facilities, the Sunday school classes, uh, the tech team that's hardly ever seen up there, but they're behind the scenes working so this can be produced properly to help us all as a church to have a system that produces. Amen? Now, some parts of the body are for protection, for producing, and for propulsion. You say, what do you mean by that? To propel one forward. For instance, your physical body. Thank God your body has legs. (laughs) Your legs propel you, carry you to the next destination you want to get to, to arrive to, right? Well, likewise, the church. There are those individuals within the church who have vision. They motivate us. They encourage us to grasp the future of what God could do and to move forward with the impossible that we might try to do something great for God's honor and glory. A church always needs people who want to do something for God. If left up to some in most churches, they hardly ever would ever have a vision to try to reach their community or to build or to grow. Most people in most churches are like the steward who received the one talent. And what did he do? He went and buried it. And when his master returned, he gave it back but with no increase at all. And because of that, Christ called him a wicked servant. And you and I have the greatest story that's ever been told, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it produces fruit. Huh? And God wants us to use that to get as many people saved and grounded as we possibly can. Amen? He wants us to have that vision to increase so that we can do something for him. And you and I, we have to have the mindset and the heart that if we go down, it will be because we're trying, we're attempting to do something great for God. And then there are some parts of the body, protection, producing, propelling, but also for proclaiming. The physical body, it has been given vocal cords to be able to speak our thoughts in words, to convey messages, to communicate. Likewise, the church, the body of Christ here and Grace Point, he gives us certain individuals who have the ability to tell the words story. And boy, I'm glad to say that we have a number of people in our church who can stand up and tell the truth. I I am so honored because of that, that they have grasped that truth and they're willing to share that truth with other people. Amen? Now, knowing all of this and Grace Point, Grace Point is one body of believers, yet we have many parts, many members And that's to fulfill, to help our church to be whole, complete, and to fulfill the purpose of God here at Grace Point. And because God says, all of us together, God wants to use us all. And what that should do to each member, first of all, it should bring you comfort. Comfort. Because God has a place for you to fit in and do something here at Grace Point. Now, sometimes in many churches, there are a lot of those people that are so proud themselves in what they can do individually. They strut sitting down. Have you ever met anybody like that? Amen. They thank their God's gift to the church. Come and see and hear me. Hear me teach, hear me pray, see how much I give, hear me speak, hear me sing. You know, they want others to know their individual efforts. Huh? I always liked Jim Cimbala when I read the first book, Fresh Fire. I remember he said that if a choir member was upset because they were not singing solos, he put them in the back of the burner in the choir And they could never sing solos until their heart got right. Because it was not about them. It's about God and it's about team. Amen? Amen? 
On the other hand, too many people think they're useless and unimportant, invaluable. And of course, that's not true. Some feel like a sign on a business that said this, Mr. Nobody. <laughs> they felt, you know, that's where they were. They're nobody. Some are, feel like the pastor, uh, his church's name was No Hope Baptist Church. <laughs> what, a, what a name to have, No Hope. Uh, anyway, even his wife didn't like his sermons, and uh, he was feeling low, low, really low. So he moved to a new church, and the first Sunday he moved his church letter, but his wife didn't move her church letter. Six months later, the deacon came up and asked her, and said, when are you going to move your letter? She said, I'm seeing if I like the pastor or not. <laughs> That's low, huh? Nah. Now, you might not be in the limelight. You might feel like you're a nobody, but remember this. Nobody is anybody. But everybody is somebody. Amen? And if you're in the family of faith and you're a member of Grace Point, your purpose might be different from the others, but you are equally needed. Whether you open that door or sweep that floor or sing on this platform, you're all equally needed. And it's a fact. It's awful when some try to do things God never equipped them to do. Huh? You ever seen that? Where you try to put something circular in the square, <laughs> you know? And it's an awful thing. You ever hear somebody teach who couldn't teach? It's awkward. I mean, it's really awkward, okay? Have you ever heard somebody sing who couldn't sing? Ooh. It's embarrassing, isn't it, huh? They start singing, you go, ooh. You watch American Idol and some of those people, oh, my goodness. Whoever told them they could sing, isn't it amazing? Hey, it's mind-boggling. Well, that's the way it is in the church sometimes. Huh? I had this one, la one lady, she had blue and green hair all the time. She wanted to sing solos all the time. And she couldn't sing very good, I'm telling you. Oh, boy. Uh, but anyway, where was I? <laughs> the problem is we don't like being what God made us to be. And let me just say to you, I always remember J. Vernon McGee, he said, listen, if God made you a big toe in the body, be the best big toe you can possibly be. Amen? Amen? And by the way, do you need a big toe? Have you ever tried to walk without a big toe? It's tough. So be the big toe you can possibly be. Amen? But if you can help fill a need, I'm telling you something, whether it's open the door, sweeping the floor, whatever it might be, it gives you comfort. Something else it does, it should bring you confidence. God can use me. Uh, I remember the story of Evangelist Junior Hill. He's a Southern Baptist preacher. And uh, he was invited to preach at First Baptist of Atlanta. And they had what they called Harvest Day. That's the trying the winning of souls. And, of course, that's Dr. Charles Stanley's church. Evangelist Junior Hill, he was in the prayer room, and he was fearful. And he began to kind of belittle himself, you know. He says, God, I'm ugly, I'm fat. He said he thought he heard an angel say amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> he said, I'm fat, I'm ugly, and in this service, Lord... Uh, they say there'll be people from 40 different states. That's usually it. I'm intimidated. They've come to hear Dr. Stanley, not me. I'm Elmer Fudd. How in the world can I preach to these people? I just have a simple sermon. Well, then he stepped back. He said, okay, okay. I know you called me to tell people how to be saved. I, I'm going to trust you. And he went out. And when he preached, that morning, 70 people were saved. Later in Dr. Stanley's office, Dr. Stanley said this, Junior, this is the greatest day in the history of our church. Later on, the evangelist, he said to himself, what if I had stepped into the pulpit and I tried to be something, someone I was not? It would have all been a failure. 
Just be who God made you to be, whatever it may be. Amen? That's what God wants. And if God made you to be a prayer, pray. A giver, give. An attender, be faithful. A teacher, teach. A deacon, serve. A helper, help. A hospitality person, greet. A cleaner, clean your church to its cleanest. Amen? A singer, sing. A quiet worshiper, be calm. A hoop and hollower, hoop. <laughs> and if God made you ugly, stay out of the public. But anyway, I... <laughs> Yeah, I'm kidding. I haven't seen any of those around here. Amen. <laughs> you know, there's times I wish I could preach like other preachers. No notes. <laughs> you know, the, the way I put my message together, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing all this, and I'm putting it down, everything like that. I don't have the memory to be able to do that. That amazes me how preachers can. I just don't have that ability, never will, ever. But I learned this, that God wants me to be just who he's made me to be. And I remind myself quite often of Jonathan Edwards, who under candlelight read his message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and it started the Great Awakening in America one time. So that encourages me. And the last point is this here. If you understand you can be used, it will deliver you from competition. With Grace Point, there's no room for pride, envy, or jealousy. We're in this together as a team. We're all part of one. We do ministry together. We root for another person's success. We're not in the little individual ministries so people can walk around like peacocks. We're members of the same body. When one wins, we all win. But when one hurts, we all hurt. I remember I, when I was a, a young man, I, I was doing construction work, and I had a shovel in my hand, and we were putting in a post for a filling station uh, iron fence around, and I hit the top of that iron thing and smashed my finger. And that little finger affected my whole body. <laughs> and when one of our people hurt, it affects us all. Isn't that true? The older man went to the doctor and he said, Doctor, my leg hurts. The doctor examined him. He said, Well, it's just old age. The old man said, Can't be. The other leg's the same age and it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> We're members one of another. And perhaps this morning you feel like you're a nobody, you're a failure, you can't do much, you don't count. I have good news for you. You're somebody to God, and you're somebody to Grace Point Church. And it takes every member to make the church body complete. We need each other. You do have a place within Grace Point because I believe that's why God has sent you here so you can help be fitly framed together with the rest of us. Ephesians 2.21 states this here. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. And when we, as this one body, this one team in one accord, it's amazing then what we can accomplish. Just notice what's going on here. Ephesians 4.13 and following. Notice till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, matured man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, we're going to be conformed to him. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that, and so on. We will have the increase when we are fitly framed together. A team. We're one. 
Amen? Now, what are you doing for Christ here at Grace Point? And we challenge you. Come, talk to us. Let us see where we could plug you in. It might not be on the platform. It might be behind a sweeper. But you'll be part of the team. And you're equally honored. I, uh, when I was a young boy, I, I went to Wood. And I was in junior high school. And we had a basketball team that was unbelievable. And uh, we won the city championships. Uh, back in those days, all the schools participated. And uh, had a great team. I remember we played our freshman who won the city that year in freshman basketball at Wood. And I remember we beat them in a scrimmage. The coach, their coach got so mad at their team. <laughs> Here we are, junior high boys. Uh, then we played the third string of the varsity team, and we whipped them. And it was unbelievable. But it was all because of one man, uh, Coach Walter Stahlhut, my coach. He created a team. We were one. We loved each other. We supported each other. We worked for each other, and we became a team. I said, I was thinking last night, okay, how does that all that work? And I wrote this down last night. This is what he helped accomplish. Each individual reaching their full potential within the team's framework. Huh? It's not me reaching my full potential so I can be elevated, but it's me reaching my full potential that the team might be successful. Huh? I believe that's what he wants in a church. And I just ask you, listen, we have a lot of volunteers here. We praise God for them. We're going to honor them. But we need more. Let's step up to the plate and let's do something for God together. Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for your goodness. And God, I just pray you'd speak to hearts today that they would be willing to come and just say, God, here I am. Whatever you want me to do, help me to be able to contact people at the church this week and may we together uh, figure out what uh, abilities that they've been given by you and God, may we go forward together so that we don't lack, so we don't limp in one area and then be strong in another area. May we come together as this team in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen.